Well, happy New Year's Eve. I see since the last time I got up here, we had some more people trickle in here. That's fantastic. All right, everybody grab your worship folder. Grab all that 3x5 card. We're not going to get to that just yet, but we're going to get to it in a few minutes here. And it's going to become very important for us. We're also going to all need your tear off today. So everybody get that tear off there for us and everything else. You don't have to pull them off just yet, but we're going we're gonna to utilize those today. New Year's Eve. Tomorrow is the start of a brand new year. 2018. Uh, some of us never dreamed of the day we'd even say 2018. For some of us, well, we thought the Lord would come back before now. <laughs> you know? uh, as we look around our world, sometimes we think, that, man, why hasn't he come back yet, you know? But he has. He's still got a plan for us. He's still got a purpose. But as we get ready to come into a new year, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hands or anything because I don't want to embarrass you, how many of you made last year's New Year's resolution? Did you actually accomplish it? Anybody? I, I'm seeing people living the word no, uh, which was probably most of you. I know I didn't make mine. Um, I went the opposite direction. Mine was to lose weight, and I gained weight. So, uh, you know, whatever. But when we come to this time of the year, and we make New Year's resolutions, whether it's to start a new diet, or you're going to work out more in this new year, or you're going to spend more time with your family, whatever it is for you in this new year, I know you're all thinking about it, because tomorrow starts a new year. 365 brand new days in front of you. What are you going to do with them? Whatever it may be, we all have goals, and we all have ambitions, don't we? As we come into a new year, we have goals and we have visions, ambitions. And, and I think that all of us, we start a new year with really good ambitions, with really good goals, and we seek to grow in those things. If it's a diet, usually that's to lose weight and to gain some discipline in your life. Well, as a church, we have goals and ambitions also. We have things that we set out to accomplish year after year after year. And every year, about this time, we, we start thinking as a board, we start thinking about what should be a focus for us this year. Where should we focus in on? What should be our goals for this year and everything else? And we had a board meeting this week, and we talked about it. We, uh, our board meeting was a little bit longer than some of the last ones have. Because we got just a really great discussion about what is this year going to shape up to be? How are we going to encourage each other on the board to stay on top of this goal? Because here's what happens, even in a church. Things happen, don't they? You know, last year we started off with this idea of renewal. There's a lot of areas that we did see a lot of great renewal in this church. But there were some things throughout the year that kind of distracted us. Kind of got us away from our initial mindset, our initial goals. And that happens in our lives too, doesn't it? Things come up and we get distracted. And we kind of veer off. And then as the year starts to come to a close, we remember, oh man, I had these ambitions. I wanted to read the entire Bible in a year this year. Some of us are trying to fit that in one day today. Because we want to reach our goals. Because as people, we are goal-oriented. At least we should be. We should have goals. Goals are not a bad thing. But goals often discourage us, don't they? Because we set a goal for ourselves, and then we come to this day, and we realize, man, we didn't reach our goal. And it's kind of discouraging. And so we go into a new year, and here's what happens so often, I think, to many of us, is that we continue to set the same goal year after year after year after year after year, and we don't accomplish it. Because we're not disciplined enough. And the problem with it is, is that so many of us set these ambitions, set these goals for ourselves, set these New Year's resolutions for ourselves. And we don't tell anybody. There are personal goals. And let me tell you something that I've learned over the years, and I think you've learned this too. I've learned that it's hard to accomplish your goals on your own. And it really is. I'm a type of person I like to work by myself. I like to kind of just 
shut my office door, you know, I like to shut my office door and kind of just work and kind of get my own goal and in my own mindset. And then I'll come up with ideas and I'll usually come down and say, like, hey, Scott, what do you think about this? And usually it's a stupid idea, so he tells me that. <laughs> and once in a while he'll go, yeah, that's a good one, let's do that. But uh, I like to work on this. I like to keep things myself. I like to, when I set out in a year, I like to have my own personal goals. And I've learned over the years that if you don't have somebody beside you helping you, you tend not to reach those goals. Have you found that to be true in your life? My, my dad is one of the most self-disciplined people I've, uh, I've ever met in my life. I'll tell you how self-disciplined he was. My dad... Uh, he used to smoke three packs a day before he was, well, no, after he was a Christian. He used to smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. That's a lot of cigarettes a day. And then some of you are trying to figure out how much that cost back then. It didn't cost that much money. So, so three packs a day. And one day he woke up and he, and he looked at my mom and he said, you know what, I'm done. And he threw his cigarettes outside. And it drizzled a little bit that afternoon because all of a sudden he got a craving. And he ran outside and he grabbed his cigarettes, but he couldn't light them because they were damp. And that was the last time my dad ever smoked. My dad was an alcoholic for years, all through high school and into college. And uh, he got into a horrible, horrible, horrible car accident. And after he woke up from that car accident, he realized that alcohol was the contributing factor to it. And he said, never again. He's never touched a drink of alcohol a day in his life since then. That was when he was 19 years old. My dad is one of these guys, he's the most self, I always look up to him and think to myself, man, I wish I could be, and I've always wanted to be, I want to be as self-disciplined as he is. To be able to just say, this is what I'm going to do, and if my dad comes to he comes to this time of year and he says, this is what I'm going to do this year. I can almost guarantee you he is going to accomplish it on his own. Because he's that self-driven. But for most of us, we're not that self-driven. We need people around us to help us grow, to help us, to help us reach those goals, to reach those ambitions. And that's the same for our church. You know, these goals, these things that we set out to do, it takes Discipline. And if we want to make our goals as a church, it takes more than just my discipline. And it takes more than just our board's discipline. It takes the discipline and the unity of an entire church. We have to unify under one thing. It takes the unity of a whole church. And we have to unify under one goal. So we're going to have a goal this year. Something that we really need to focus on. Something that we really need to unify under. And we want to focus this year on growth. On growth. Now, before you think that we're all we're interested here at Calvary Bible Church is numbers and all that kind of stuff, just take that right out of your mind. Although, if I'm being honest with you, we are interested in numbers because God is interested in numbers. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here. You see, we have this faulty idea that God is, is only interested in our spiritual growth. And God is interested in our spiritual growth. Don't misread what I'm saying. But there are factors to our spiritual growth that we have to consider. Basic commands of God that we have to consider as we approach a new year, as we approach it with this whole idea of growth. So here's what I want to do this morning. We're going to explore four areas of growth that we have got to focus on this year. And it all starts with number one there in your notes. If you have your notes, pull them out. Number one is spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. If we are going to focus on growth for the new year, it has to start right here. It has to start with spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is one of the most important things that we can focus on as a church. Because everything that we do, everything that we say, everything, every, every, everything from top to bottom here at Calvary Bible Church has to start here. It has to start. That's why it's number one in your notes. It has to start with this whole idea of spiritual growth. Look at Hebrews 6 1 with me for a minute. It's in your notes. Everything I'm reading from today is out of the English Standard Version. 
Hebrews 6 1 says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. And I put the rest of the verse in there for you can read that on your own later there. But we are to work our way past the elementary things. We are to be on a journey in our walk with God. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? I mean, how do we grow past? How do we get past these elementary things that the Bible talks about? How do we get past that? Well, first of all, we're going to do everything we can to help you as a church. One of the things we're going to do, we start next week. You, 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 we talked about the book a minute ago. I am a church member. This is our, every year at the beginning of the year, we kind of started this last year with 40 Days in the Word. And, and this year, we're going to do a spiritual growth campaign. And our spiritual growth campaign this year is I am a church member. And what this, what this series is going to do is going to help us better understand what it means for us as people who come to a church. How do we operate within the church? Or we hear this a lot of times, and maybe, maybe you're not a member of Calvary Bible Church, and that's okay. You don't have to be a member of Calvary Bible Church to, to, to even become a part of one of our small groups or anything like that. We want you to be a part of one of our small groups, no matter what. So if you're walking out and you say, hey, I like what I heard today. I kind of think this book sounds interesting. Grab one on your way out. We've got, we've got plenty. If we need to order more, we'll order more. It only takes us a couple days to get those. We're going to be focusing in on what it means to be a member of a church. Because I, I think here's what we do so often. We go to our membership class and we talk about what it means to be a member in that church. But I think we forget a lot of times. And I think we just need a reminder sometimes. What does it mean to be a church member? Our small groups are going to be focused around this. Our Sunday morning, um, Sunday school classes that we have here. We have some that are going to happen throughout the week. I know mine is on Wednesday nights. So if you want to join Wednesday at 630 right here, we meet right here in the auditorium. And we're going to be going through the book also. If you want to join up with that small group, we've got some other ones. And we'll be emailing those out to you this week so you can see none of our small groups start until next Sunday or even the week after that. So mine doesn't start this Wednesday or anything like that. So you won't miss anything. But we want you to be a part of these things. The other part of our spiritual growth is that we want to see more of you involved in our small groups. We feel that small groups, when we sat down as a board, and I know if this is your first time here at Calvary, this is not a normal, typical Sunday morning sermon for you. All right? We're talking about today, we're talking about what our vision is for the new year. And we do this every year. We try to give you vision. We try to lay it out for you. Because here's something that we've learned, and this is something that the Bible says. When there is no vision, the people will perish. We've got to have a vision. We have to have a vision for where God wants to take us. And part of our vision this year is that we want to see more of you involved in small groups. As a matter of fact, we talked about, you know, in one of our uh, leadership trainings that we did here at Calvary, we talked about this whole idea of what is a win in the church. And so we talked about wins in our board meeting on Thursday night. And here's our win for this year. I think I put it in the notes. Here's our, here's our win this year. Can you get that to me? 80% small group participation. We want to see 80% of our church. Whether you're a member, not if you just come to church, this is, you, you call Calvary Bible Church your church, but you've never gone through a membership class, doesn't matter. We want to see 80% of our congregation. We'd love that to be 100%. I mean, that's our ultimate goal. But we said this year, we want to see 80% of you involved in a small group in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's our Wednesday night small group, whether it's one of the ones that meets throughout the week, whether it's Sunday morning. We want to see, because we feel that spiritual growth happens better in a small group. We learn in circles, folks, not in rows. Because we learn from each other. That's why a lot of times when we come to a small group, I don't know about you, but a lot of times we get in a circle, don't we? It seems that way at least. We get in a circle, we join around a table where we can see each other. In a setting like this, all you can see is the back of the head in front of you. Unless you're sitting right in the front row and then all you got is my beautiful face. Sorry, Austin. We want to see all of us. We want to see this whole idea of small groups growing here at Calvary Bible Church. So with that said, we need you to participate. But we also are going to need some more of you to open your homes this year. To open your homes to small groups, we have got tons of material here at Calvary. 
Every six months we get a box that's just full of, uh, of material that you can use in your small groups. And we're more than happy to, 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 to give those to you, to help you out, train you any way that we can. But we need more of it. To say, hey, I can open my home to a small group. I believe that if we're going to see our church grow, it has to start with this whole idea of small groups and spiritual growth. I want to see a church where people are what 1 Peter 2, 2 talks about. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that it may grow up into salvation. That we would long for God's word this year. So with that said, we're going to be doing some different things on Sunday mornings this year. We're going to be doing a little, not that we're going to steer away completely from topical things that we talk about here and there, but here's some, some series that are coming up for you. Obviously, we've got I Am a Church Member that we're going to be doing over the course of six weeks. We're going to be spending some time this year, and I, I haven't quite finished the whole series, just so I don't know exactly how long it's going to be. But we're going to study the life of one of the greatest men of the Bible, David. We're going to spend some time doing that this year. We're going to spend time in some books of the Bible this year, where we're just systematically work through a book of the Bible. What does God's Word say? Here's something else we're going to do. Starting next week, on your worship, on your little notes that you get, there's going to be a memory verse for you that's taken out of each and every week's sermon. Of the talk. Now, we're not going to quiz you on that. Uh, I might keep a pocket full of candy in case you come and tell me your, your, your verse. I'll give, you a, I'll give you a piece of candy or something, all right? I better actually do that now. Also, someone's going to actually test me and see if I'm really doing that. We want you, we're going to give you every tool possible to help you grow spiritually in this new year. We want you memorizing God's Word. We want you, you know, God's Word says, Psalms says, hide God's Word in your heart so you might not what? Sin against God. If we're hiding God's Word in our heart, man, then we know what God's Word has to say. You have my commitment this year to teach you God's Word in an incredible way. I want you to just grow and grow and grow. I will do my best to help you. I'll do my best. So we want to grow spiritually. The second area of growth we want to do is number two, is relational growth. Relational growth. I'm going to spend some time talking about this. We're actually going to spend some time in our I Am a Church member talking about this very important subject. Here's something I think that we really need to work on as a church. This is not just an issue for the church. It's really an issue for the whole world, isn't it? But we're talking about the church this morning. Our relationships are hurting. Our relationships are hurting. Whether it's in a church setting, whether it's in, in work setting or whatever, our relationships in this world are hurting. Our marriage relationships are hurting. Our friendship relationships are hurting. Our, our family relationships are hurting. Would you agree with me that it is getting harder and harder and harder in our world today to trust people? Or am I the only one that feels tired? It's getting harder and harder and harder in our world to trust people. In our world and in our church, we have a massive gossip problem, don't we? A massive gossip problem. Let's just be honest with each other this morning, okay? All of us. We're all in the same boat here. We all get wrapped up in conversations that we shouldn't get wrapped up in. Every one of us. There isn't anybody here who's not. And if you are not guilty of it, please come see me afterwards because I want to know what your secret is. We all get wrapped up in conversations that we should not be having. This is what James was talking about when he penned the words in James 3.6. Here's what he says. Look at it with me. It's in your notes. It says, The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. The tongue is a fire. Man, is that true, isn't it? And is that true? I know for me that the one thing that gets me in more trouble is my tongue. I don't know about you, but I know that's true for me. When I was a kid, I was, when I was in sixth grade, we had a teacher who, if we got in trouble, he'd make us write verses. 
And I had, so he was our fifth grade teacher and our sixth grade teacher. I went to a small Christian school. And one of the verses he loved to make us write was James 3, 6 out of the King James Version. And so I set out as my goal, and I accomplished my goal. This is like one goal I accomplished in my whole lifetime. I set out in my life, and in my goal, my sixth grade year, that I would get in trouble every single day and have to write James 3, 6. Ten times every single day. I accomplished that goal. <laughs> the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. And set on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. That's, the James, that's King James Version. I will never forget that verse. I accomplished my goal. Well, folks, listen. Honestly, getting kind of back to the subject here. Gossip is so destructive in our world, isn't it? Gossip is so destructive in our churches. We have to take this issue serious. We have to. When we hear people talking about others or, or gossiping, we need to put a stop to it right then and right there. And I'm not just talking about church. I'm talking about life in general. Whether it's work or school or everyday life, we've got to put a stop to gossip. The tongue, if you ask me, the tongue is one of the most destructive things in the world. If you ask me, the tongue is one of the most destructive things in the world. With our tongue, we can build up. And with our tongue, we can tear down. God says this in Ephesians 4.29. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. God says that our talk should, should only be that that is building another up. That should be our talk. So when we find ourselves in these conversations, and we all know what, we're talk, we all know what I'm talking about. Well, did you hear what John did? Did you hear what Susie did? And the question you should ask yourself is, is this conversation I'm about ready to have, is it going to build up? Or is it going to tear down? If it's going to tear down, it needs to stop. It needs to stop. And I know sometimes we listen to talk because somebody gets talking to us and we don't want to hurt their feelings. We don't want to say, you know what, hold on a second. You really, you, you got to stop that. We don't want to do that because we don't want to hurt their feelings. But did you ever think about the person's feelings that's being murdered by those words right then and there? You ever think about that? You see, I don't think we ever think about the other person. I think we get in these conversations, these gossip conversations, and somebody starts and we go, oh, well, I need to just go on the go. That's not right. That's not what God says to do. God says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is going to build up. It's going to build up. Are your words building up or are they tearing down? Are they building up or are they tearing down? Here's another one. Sometimes we get in these conversations with people and they start in on John or Susan or whoever it is. They start in on them and they get to the end of that conversation and here's what we do. Oh, thank you so much for letting me vent. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. You just murdered them with your words, but you're welcome. I'm glad I could be here for you. Because that's what we do, isn't it? Because we're a good friend. We're going to let them vent after they just murdered somebody with their words. You know another way we gossip that I think that we don't think about very often? Is that sometimes we gossip through prayer requests, don't we? I need you to pray for John. And if you stop there, that'd probably be okay. But here's what we do. I need you to pray for John, and then we spell out all the nasty, ugly details about how horrible of a person they are and everything else. Now, we want you to share your prayer requests. Because we want to pray with you. But we don't always need all the gory details, folks. Sometimes you just need to keep that to yourself, what you know. 
And sometimes you're spewing out things in a prayer request that you heard from a third party. And you don't even know if it's true or not. It's important to pray for people. Don't get me wrong. We want you to put those things on your... We want you to put prayer requests on your tear-offs and everything because we want to pray for you this year. Be careful what you say because sometimes the only reason we are sharing that prayer request is to gossip about them. Listen, we have got to stop the gossip that happens so often. We've got to stop it. So I'm going to challenge you in this new year that when you hear gossip, you put an end to it. You put an end to it. It doesn't matter where that gossip is coming from, you put an end to it. If we want to grow in our relationships this year, we've got to stop the gossip. So first of all, we want to grow spiritually this year. Second of all, we want to grow relationally. Number three, we want to grow numerical. Numerical growth. Now we come to this one, and some of us think, wow, that's, that's really shallow. That's shallow that you, would, that you would even put that up there. We should only focus on spiritual growth because that's all that matters. I've heard this over the year. God is not interested in numbers. Well, who says so? Who says that God's not interested in numbers? And you can go through the Bible and see where God counted the nation of Israel. There's a book in the Bible called Numbers. <laughs> you see, to me, and the numbers we're talking about are the numbers of lost people. People who need Jesus. There's a reason that God says this in Matthew 28. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. You've heard me talk about this verse probably a hundred times in four years. But until you all start doing it, we're going to keep talking about it. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God says, go and make disciples. God doesn't say, go, get saved, and then go sit in the pew. God doesn't say that, does he? He says, go and make disciples. Here's what we're going to do. Pull out your 3 by 5 card. I know you're all dying to know what that's for. That 3 by 5 card is for you. I know I don't give you very many things. Usually I'm telling you to give it away to somebody, okay? But the 3 by 5 card, this is how much I care about you. I'm not in bottles this week, just for you. Get your 3 by 5 card out. Hold on to it. Now I want everybody to see, has everybody torn their chair? If you haven't torn it off, let me count to three because it sounds really cool when we do it all together. Ready? One, two, three. Tear. All right, five of you did tear. All right, that was good. Get the tear off, and we're going to get to this just now. Hold on to it. We are starting a year long campaign starting today. It is a year-long campaign called Invite Your One. Invite Your One. We're going to ask everybody who is here today. Everybody who is here today. You know, even if you don't come to Calvary Bible Church, maybe you attend a different church, I still want you to do this, okay? Do it for your church. I want you to write the name of one person. Just one person. Not a whole family or anything like that. Hopefully the whole family will come over. We want you to write the name of one person. It has to be different than your husband. And, if your husband and wife, it has to be different. We want you to write the name of one person on your tear-off and on your card, on your 3x5 card. I want you to take your 3x5 card and I want you to take that and I want you to hang it somewhere where you're going to see it every single day. So whether that's on your mirror in the bathroom, whether that's in the mirror in your bedroom, in your car, wherever it may be, I want you to take that 3 by 5 card with that one name on it. Every time you look at it, I want you to pray for that individual. Do not lose. If you need to, bring your card, bring your 3 by 5 card to me, and I will go and I will get it laminated. If you need it. I think we have a laminator here at church. If not, I'll figure out a way to pay for it for you. This is how serious I want you to do this this year. Now, I want you to take your tear off, and I want you to write the same name that you wrote on your 3x5 card. And that tear-off is going to come to me. And it's going to come to our board. And here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're committing as a board this year to you. And also, put your name on it, too, so we know who it is. So we can pray for you, and we can pray for your one. Here's what we're committing. 
Every Monday, I'm sending out the name of five individuals that are the ones. And your board is going to pray for those five individuals for the entire week. And we're going to do this all year round. Now, if your one comes to church, if your one gets saved, you need to let us know. So that we can praise God for that. We set a goal. We set a numerical goal this year to see our church grow by 125 people. We roughly have 100 adults that are here on Sunday morning. Not this Sunday morning, but most Sunday mornings. And we roughly have about 25 kids that are, that are here in, in our kids' church downstairs. So we want to double. Give me the number up on the screen there. Because here's what 125 represents. Oh, yeah, that's inviting one. Go to the next one there. 125 equals lost souls. Now let me tell you something about this. We're not interested in inviting people who already attend a good Bible-believing church. We're not interested. Let them go to their church. What we're interested in is people who do not attend church anywhere. People who maybe never grace the doors. And so I'm going to invite one. Write that name of a person you think not well. Ever, they're never going to come. My roommate, their church did this last year. They did this campaign, Invite Your One. And his church is a little bit bigger than ours. I think they run about 400 or so. And over the course of last year, they saw 250 brand new people come to church. Because they prayed. They prayed for those individuals. The board prayed for them. They did the same thing. I'm just, I, listen, I stole this from him and he stole it from Tom Rainer, okay? I mean, we're just stealing ideas from people because it works. We're going to pray, but we need you to pray. We need you to commit to pray for that individual. We need you to commit to invite them to be a part of Calvary Bible Church. Easter's coming up in just a few weeks. Oh. A couple months. Yeah, April April 1st is Easter this year. I always know when, when Easter is. That's a great time to invite your one. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for your ones every week. We're putting those five names, rotation. We're going to rotate it throughout the, throughout the year and everything else. So our goal is that by December 31st, exactly a year from today, we will have, give me that number, Give it to me on the screen there. 250 people attending Calvary Bible Church. That's our goal. You might think that's a lofty goal. It is. We need your help. I can't do it. Our board can't do it. We can help. We need you. We need you. You see, folks, here's the thing. If we're growing spiritually and we're growing relationally, I honestly don't think that we can't grow numerically. Because here's what I know about spiritual growth. One of the basic commands of God is to go and make disciples, correct? That's one of the basic commands of God. If we're growing spiritually, we'll be going and making disciples. They go hand in hand. I honestly, my personal belief is I do not believe you can be growing spiritually and not reaching people. Or at least not telling people about Christ. I just don't see how you can do it. Because if we're not sharing our faith, folks, if we're not sharing the message of Jesus Christ with individuals, then we are disobeying God. Disobeying the church, you're not disobeying anybody else. God is the one who said, go and make disciples. I can say that. God did. God said, Jesus said, it's one of the last things he said before he left this earth. Go and make disciples. And folks, I cannot stress it enough. We've got to go this year. We've got to go. We're going to be reminding you throughout the year. I'm hoping that eventually we can have stories of people who've come through the doors here. And people who will be willing to share their stories that we can share with you. I, I would love to see us have a baptistry up here every single week. And we are baptizing people every single week. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, how could you not get excited about that? This is what God has called us to do. This is what God has called us to be about. And so to talk about numerical growth is not shallow at all. I think it's the very thing that God wants us to be about. 
It's not about my ego or, or this church's ego. It's about reaching people for Christ. And that's what we need to be about. So the first area of growth is spiritual growth. The second area is relational growth. The third area is numerical growth. And I believe all of these things build on each other. But this one here kind of stands alone, if you ask me. The last one is financial growth. We love to talk about this one, don't we? We don't. It's so often that, that we don't, we as pastors, we don't like to talk about this because he, here, here's, a, here's an idea that a lot of people in our world have. Is that all the church cares about is your money. That may have been true at some point in time. That may be true for some churches. I can't speak to that. I can speak to this. It's not true for us. It's not true for us. Not, as, not, not here at Calvary. But it's not a subject that we can avoid either. We have to talk about it because God talked about it. Look at this passage with me. Malachi 3, 10 through 12. Here's what it says. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. I want you to underline put me to the test in that verse. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour, out, and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. And your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will what? We'll call you what? Read it with me. All nations will call you what? Blessed. For you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. I want you to look at this passage for just a minute. We're going to close out with this. I want you to really look what it says. It says, first of all, bring the full tithe. When we talk about a tithe, in Scripture, you, there's, there's no arguing this point. In Scripture, the tithe is 10%. That's what was commanded through the Old Testament. It goes right on into the New Testament. Anybody that says that it doesn't, it does. Okay? It does. The tithe is 10%. Now, there is a bit of a debate as to what the storehouse actually is. But most scholars will tell you that in that day, and in that time, it was the church or the temple at that time. That's what I've always believed. That's what I'm sticking with. That's what the scholars kind of, kind of teach us. So God is saying, bring your tithe to the church. He goes on and says something here that he doesn't say anywhere else in Scripture. He says, test me in this. God says, test me. Test me and see if I won't throw open the gates of heaven to you and pour down blessing upon you. Now, I've said this before to you, and I want you to get this. God is not an ATM machine. If you give 10%, he's not going to give you 20% back. That's not how it works. But God will bless your life. Now, I can tell you stories, and I think I've told you some stories before, and I won't go into, into too many of these stories or anything like that. But there's been times in my life where we, we sat back and said, all right, God, we're going to give our 10% back to you. I don't know how we're going to make those bills, but we're going to do it. I remember one year, our, we gave $150 to our church. I was paid 1500 bucks. And that's pretty much what this and I lived on. And we had a bill that came up. It was one of those yearly bills that you don't always account for. And it was 150 bucks. And I said, all right, Missy, well, I guess that we're going to have to figure out what to do here. But we're going to give this 150 back to God. Not the church, to God. And we did. We wrote the check for 150 bucks. Put it in the offering plate on Sunday morning. And... The next day, I went out to the mailbox, and I opened up the mailbox. I pulled out this envelope with no name on it, except for mine. And I opened it up, and inside was a check for 150 bucks. And I ran inside. I remember running inside saying, Miss, you're not going to believe this! And we were floored. Why? God took care of us, didn't he? He supplied the need. But I also think that God was seeing if we were going to be faithful. If we were going to be faithful. And I know that some of us, we come to the subject of, uh, of money, and I'm going to close out with this last bit here. We come to the subject of money, and we say, you know, you don't understand my, my situation. I have nothing. And let me just say this to you. I know, as an individual, what it means to live on nothing. My wife and I, when we lived in Colorado, we left, I think we were making close to about $80,000 a year when we lived in Elgin. 
do both of our jobs. I, I was selling cars and I was doing well and she was working the bank full time and we, we, we lived pretty well. And this opportunity came up for a church in Buffalo, Colorado. It was always my dream to live in Colorado anyway. But we realized that when we went there, they could only pay us $1,500 a month. So we said, all right, God, we know this is where you want us to be. And we had our first child, Elena. And so we took our little family and we moved to Pueblo, Colorado for $1,500 a month. And my wife got a part-time job. She wanted to be home with Elena. Well, then she got pregnant with Taylor shortly after we moved. And I said to Missy, I said, you know what, Missy? I said, I, I just want you to be home. I want you to raise the kids and be home. And so we sat down and looked at her bills, and there was just no way. No way. And so we got our tax return that year, paid off everything we could pay off with our tax return. And we said, all right, God, and I went to my church, and I said, here's the situation, guys. I know you probably can't afford this, but I'm, I'm going to take a step of faith if you'll take a step of faith. Otherwise, I'm going to have to get a part-time job. And they said, what do you need, Pastor? And I said, I need $2,000 a month for a family of four to live on. That's all I need. And they said, all right, Pastor, we're going to do it. And they did. They took a step of faith. And we took a step of faith. And we gave our 10% back every month, every month, $200 every month. I know what it's like to be on the doors, to be on the doorsteps of a food bank because you don't have money to buy food. I know what that's like. I was there. I remember one month we had no money because we had all those little extra bills that come up, tags for your car or whatever. And we had to pay for those things. And I looked at Missy one time and I said, I remember sitting there, we, we, we sat down and we, we looked at our bills and I said, Missy, we don't have enough money to go buy food for our kids. What are we going to do? And, you know, that night, a lady from our church, she had no idea what the situation was. She, she showed up with baby food and, and diapers and all kinds of stuff. She said, I don't know why, I just felt like I had to bring this by today. Okay, so that took care of Taylor. There was still no food for Milena or me or Missy. And I had to talk to a lady in, in church, and she said, go try out this place. And so we went, we stood in line. Cold of, it was in the winter, and we stood in line. And we waited for an hour, and we got inside the building, and they gave us food. I know what it's like, folks, to not have anything. But let me tell you something. Something I learned through all of this. That no matter what it was, God always, listen to what I'm saying, God always supplied my need. I want my need. Always. Always, always, always. There wasn't one night that my family didn't go without food. Not one night. We didn't have chips or soda or anything like that. We even drink tap water. God always supplied the need. Always. And I believe, I know, it's because we were faithful to God and always returning back to Him what was already His. And so this year, we, we want to see our church grow financially, but that's not for us. You see, so many times we talk about this whole idea of tithing. And a lot of people think that's for us as a church because we want money. Folks, it's not for us, it's for you. I can't even begin to describe to you the blessings of God when you stay faithful to Him and you return to Him what is His. You can't help but give. God can do more with 90% than you can do with 100%. Trust me. But God says, you know what? Hey, Test me. Test me and see what I'll do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. And God, we have a big year planned. We've talked about a lot of things this morning. But Father, I know that this year at Calvary Bible Church is going to be a great year. But Father, it can't be just pastors and the board doing it. 
It has to be our people. The people of Calvary Bible Church. And so, Father, right now, I pray for everybody sitting here today, whether they're a part of Calvary or not, I pray for them this morning, Father. Those who are watching on Facebook Live, I'm going to pray for them also, God. And Father, as we start on this campaign of inviting our one, that we will stay faithful to that God. That each and every day we will see that individual's name. That we will pray for that individual. And that, Father, as a board and as pastors, as we commit to the people of our church, that, Father, we will pray for them. And we will pray for their ones also. God, I'm excited about what you're going to do this year. It's going to be an exciting year. 2018 is going to be a year to remember. Calvary Bible Church. We're excited about what you're going to do, God. But help us, Father, not to get distracted. To stay focused on our goals, God. To stay focused on what I believe you are calling us to do, God. Father, it's going to be awesome. So I pray. I pray for this church this morning. I pray, Father, that we grow spiritually. Father, we grow relationally. And Father, we see a church right here that is so grounded in unity, Father. Father, I pray that we do see numerical growth here at Calvary. That people are coming here and finding a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that we see this church grow financially. Not for us, Father. Not for this church. But for our people, Father. That they will take to heart what your word says. Not what we say, but what your word says, God. And that we will obey. And live in obedience to you, God. Thank you so much for all that you do.